So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 121, which is a really great group chat that we just had with Jack Grutzinger, who's the CEO of SeatGeek. So SeatGeek is a leading marketplace for fans to buy and sell tickets to live events across categories like sports, music, entertainment, and more. So SeatGeek has raised over $400 million from top investors like Excel and Founder Collective and has gone on to be a leader in the online ticketing space. So this is a really great chat with Jack where we got to learn more about the founding story of SeatGeek, did a deep dive into it as a mobile-first ticketing marketplace, got to learn more about how it's evolved and scaled, and also had a really great group Q&A. So really enjoyed this conversation. Now you're going to find out a great watch to the end. So Jack, welcome to the uh, group chat. And uh, you know you have some really incredible experience uh, building and scaling SeatGeek, which uh, many of us here have probably uh, not only heard of, uh, but also used. So uh, you know, really excited to have you join us here today and dive into things. Uh, before we do, though, I think it might be great if you're going to start off by sharing a little bit more on your background, though, for those that uh, don't know you. Yeah. Started various companies for a bunch of my life, most of them failures. I went to school at Dartmouth where I met one of my CE co-founders, a guy named Russ. While we were there, we started, we dressed it up in fantasy language, which was basically an online furniture rental company, which actually had some success and at least the best a good learning experience for us. Started CE shortly thereafter, worked a little bit around the ticketing industry, but I would say by no means were we founding it from a place of deep expertise or understanding what was broken. We were pretty confident that Things were broken and you know, the basic thesis was this was a category that on one hand delivers magical life affirming life changing moments but the digital experience associated with buying tickets has historically been among the hate, most hated on the internet right up there with interacting with your cable company or your least favorite airline so i thought there was a room to approve that from a user experience standpoint we started focused specifically on data and Try to add transparency, the thinking being that people don't really know what they're buying and that it's a more complex data landscape than a lot of other categories. And we were at the time doing meta search, meaning instead of selling individual uh, tickets ourselves, we really sat on top of other marketplaces, much like Kayak does. I won't get into the full company history, but eventually moved into being a marketplace ourselves into the enterprise side of our value chain as well. Awesome. Thanks for uh, that kind of a quick kind of rundown. And, uh, you know, just for, for, I guess, for like a snapshot of kind of like where you're at uh, today, you know, uh, could you maybe just kind of give us like an overview of uh, SeatGeek today and then we'll kind of go back to the uh, to the founding story maybe? Yeah, we're around 900 employees. We're, I can't give the exact number, but hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, billions of dollars of GMP. Uh, majority of that in the United States, although a decent business in the UK as well. Our team is relatively global. We're in 10 or 15 countries or so. And specifically from a strategy product standpoint, what really differentiates us is that we do everything across the entire value chain of buying a ticket, which believe it or not, is actually novel. Many companies like StubHub exclusively deal in the secondary market, in the resale market. So, you know, there's companies like Get Me In in Europe, in the US, most of them are secondary. There's also a few primary companies of note. Ticketmaster is the most common and most widely known one. What we do it differentiates us that we do we both we do everything in between and it's all tightly integrated into a single piece of technology so it delivers a pretty atomic seamless experience and we can also capture better economics results yeah that's a that's a actually a great kind of segue into uh, what i wanted to uh, cover which was it seems like you know from some of my kind of research and uh, speaking with others in the space um you know in the past that there's kind of like the uh, i guess you could say like the primary market and secondary and then you know with SeatGeek, more of the uh, kind of vertically integrated approach on the enterprise side. So, you know, w was that something that you uh, started out from for the beginning or was there some kind of like uh, insight that led to that along the way? Like I mentioned, we started not, we didn't sell anything. We just did meta search and then linked to other sites on a secondary basis. Uh, we eventually realized that meta search was pretty limiting in a few ways. It was the economics aren't very good. It's also limiting from a user experience standpoint because you can't really control the buyer purchase attendance experience. So we got into the full marketplace side of the business, meaning we actually handle transactions. We dealt with customer service. We brought supply directly onto our site and experienced good growth from that, particularly because we were very early in mobile and very focused on mobile growth before a lot of others were, but reached a point where we were really running up against 
Ticketmaster and the limitations in their business model that they really imposed on the rest of the industry. And I think we could have built a really strong, meaningful business without being directly in the enterprise primary world, but we thought we could build an even bigger and even more meaningful one if we did. And also thought it was a really big opportunity because given their monopoly position, no one had really tried a very long time to unseat them and design major teams. The traditional way that people tried to compete with Ticketmaster was uh, by starting at small scale. This is something that Eventbrite did. Any of you are familiar with Eventbrite? So they started by doing very early on clubs and knitting festivals and, and very small scale event. And I tried to move up with the idea of eventually getting towards ticketing at t Stadium. So we went in with the intentional strategy of starting at the opposite end of the market. And uh, first three clients were Major League Soccer teams we had, and NFL teams. And uh, subsequently moved into other pro sport categories. Yeah, so that's actually uh, something I wanted to uh, get into a little bit more, which is, uh, you know, partnerships. So, you know, going back to the early days, you know, uh, did you find it really challenging, you know, uh, securing those first initial partnerships? Yeah, super. We didn't have any track record, so we had to give up a ton and basically throw ourselves completely at the company at what were very sub-economic deals. We did it knowing that if we could sign some of the, you know, a few, then we could use that as a building block to uh, get momentum and not be in that state forever. And it helped that we compete against a disliked incumbent for which there is historically no alternatives. So there's a pretty strong appetite among people we were selling to, to move and to try something else. They just didn't have any choice until we came around. Got it. And then, uh, you know, in the, in the early days too, you know, how were you going about like uh, acquiring kind of consumer demand? I would say on the, on the demand side. There's a bunch of stuff we did. I'd say the, the singular biggest thing that drove our growth was I mentioned a moment ago mobile which now is like no shit not exactly an interesting thing to say but back when we I think we launched our first iOS app in 2012 at the time it's hard for me to remember this even though I did it uh, there was substantial apprehension about spending any amount of money on an iPhone so people the, the notion at the time was that a $200 transaction which is around our average order value was more than people were willing to sell on their phone for trust issues. As a result, there were no reasonable apps in our category in the app store. There were the few, but they were basically just sandboxed, you know, HTML sites that someone had put a wrapper around, complete garbage. So we built, I think, what was really the first reasonable, non terrible ticketing app in the app store. And this was at kind of like the dawn of Facebook bad installs and other mobile driven marketing things that have now become mature. When there's no one else who can sell anything in your category, you can buy installs at five cents and monetize them at five dollars or fifty dollars. The math works out pretty well. So, so we use the app to drive a ton of growth. Um, obviously, others caught up. Others built apps. It was no longer such a there's not a lot of defensibility around that, but it was enough to give us a pretty big head start. And uh, you know, like many marketplaces, having a critical mass gave us a lot more market power to then allow us to drive down supply prices, get better on, get more supply and eventually get into the enterprise business. Yeah, that's actually something I was gonna, you know, ask about was, you know, was there like a specific kind of moments along the way that kind of stand out to you or, you know, maybe that kind of like initial kind of flywheel kicked in or, you know, pivotal moments in, a, in growth? The mobile one is, is the biggest that comes to mind. Obviously getting into the enterprise business for us introduces a geographic flywheel every time we launch in a new market. So if we sign, say, the Dallas Cowboys, we're gonna have a disproportionate number of fans using SeatGeek in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and allows us to do very well. Uh, it is pretty geospecific, so in the similar way that ride sharing or food delivery might grow on a city-by-city -city basis. We, we don't literally have a GM model in the, in the way that many of those companies do, but there's a, from a network effect standpoint, pretty um, uh, location-specific way that we've grown. But beyond that, there you know we've been around for 13 years. There has not been a lot of we double overnight kind of moments, a lot of slow, steady plugging away at 80 different things, each of which drive growth and figuring out what works well, trying to optimize that. Yeah. Can relate to the slow and steady and just trying things. And yeah, like you said, seeing what works, um, but you did bring up a pretty great example there. Say, uh, say for instance, with the Dallas Cowboys, right? So say when you sign them, you know, how are they kind of using a uh, SeatGeek 
And then could you uh, maybe share more about, you know, what that uh, experience is like on, on their end from, you know, the, from the enterprise kind of partnership side and then how consumers would, you know, uh, typically kind of like hear about that and, you know, uh, purchase tickets and their actual experience? Yeah, like I mentioned, we compete directly with Ticketmaster selling primary ticketing software. What that means is software that a venue like at t Stadium and the Cowboys use to really run all of their business. So that's everything from running the box office, selling tickets, season tickets, access control, which is people actually, the hardware that people use to scan in to get into the, the event, um, CRM, email marketing, food and beverage, lots of different components of the live entertaining experience go through our software. On that note, as far as like on the, on the product side, uh, so, so I was doing a little bit of research and, uh, you know, so that you guys um, uh, have a rally. So for, from on the consumer side, you know, for uh, to actually innovating and having a product experience uh, for consumers for, for, for the event. Um, so could you maybe share a little bit more about, you know, what that's like and, uh, you know, uh, maybe some of the learnings from, from when you launched that? Yeah, Rally, the product you mentioned, is all about the in-venue experience. So up till, till we launched that, SeatGeek was a product that you would use to discover, search for a ticket, eventually buy that ticket, get it on your phone, scan in. But then once you've scanned in and you're at the event, you probably put our app away and nothing think about us again until you wanted to go to something else, which felt like a missed opportunity in two ways. One, because obviously uh, we're capitalists and we want people to keep using SeatGeek as much as we can. But also because live events were these places where there was just no software that was enhancing the experience. And there's kind of an interesting, a bit of an aside, but history on why that is. Because till five years ago, you couldn't reliably assume that everyone in a major venue had a network connection because it was a, basically a Wi-Fi slash cellular networking problem that hadn't been fully solved. Now it has been. And we are in a disproportionately advantaged position to... to do that because you literally have to have the SeatGeek app to get in, uh, unless you're with someone else who does, but it's required to scan in. We have your identity, we have your payment information in most cases, we have your social graph, we know where your city, you're located. So kind of a perfect storm for us to navigate around the venue, order food, upgrade their seat, find their friends, do lots of different things in the venue itself. So we launched that during COVID. One thing we did to kind of keep ourselves busy while everyone was staying inside. And a uh, big part of our strategy and a big part of our product. Now, what are some of the opportunities that you kind of see um, when it comes to like innovation uh, within the space? And, you know, maybe uh, not just from like the data side and from, from some of the kind of, you know, the venues, but, um, you know, what the future could kind of look like on, on that end. Yeah, when it comes to Rally and the in-event experience, we're still in the very early innings of doing that. We, uh, it's an early product. And I think it's, unlike other things we've done, there's really no, no one else even trying. So it's fun because we get to actually figure out kind of hopefully what that looks like across venues in the US and abroad. Separately, big area of product focus for us is pricing. For those of you who have bought sports or concert tickets, you may be familiar that it works, you know, in many ways there's a lot of analogs with the travel industry because you've got expiring inventory that's worth zero dollars the minute something happens um, that has uh, unexpected demand that fluctuates a lot. And yet, if you compare how travel and live entertainment are priced, it's radically different. Travel is very sophisticated. In many, for many pro sports teams, pricing is basically a few MBAs firing up Excel once a week in a meeting and talking about how they should be priced. It's not, it's not optimal. So we have a lot of pricing technology that we use to help our teams make more money, our clients make more money. Which, by the way, doesn't just mean increasing prices. In many cases, it means decreasing prices because they have them priced in a way that they're not going to sell out. So let's, how do we optimize the venue to get as many people there, make it a fun show, and make sure the artist and the team makes money in the process? We have not invested heavily in, you know, topic of product in our world, NFTs and the blockchain come up quite a bit. We've made the intentional choice not to invest heavily there now but rather use Rally as a platform for our clients to build things into if they, if they so choose. Yeah, thanks for sharing more with us yeah, on that. I was definitely going to uh, ask about uh, Web3 and NFTs. Uh, we, have, we have a lot in the uh, community that are focused. I figured I'd preempt you there. Yeah, yeah. But I, I did actually want to go back to the uh, topic of pricing, right? So pricing is, of course, uh, something that comes up all the time with uh, marketplace founders and teams. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty powerful kind of lever that we can use. Um, but I, I think we've probably all heard a lot of uh, examples, you know, recently within the ticketing space, as far as like the kind of supply and demand mismatch, you know, with some of the 
the biggest examples of say, for instance, like a Taylor Swift kind of concert, right? Um, but, you know, is that like a true kind of outlier where that, you know, with the mismatch? And then could you maybe share a little bit more about that from, uh, you know, if you kind of gave us an overview of how the supply and demand kind of matching works within the space and then more of like the actual normal example? I wish it was so simple as saying Taylor Swift's an outlier and the rest of the world likes that it looks like this, but it's not. In the case of Taylor Swift, there were probably the most in-demand live entertainment in the history of the world. Um, and there was radically more demand that could be filled given the number of nights she was playing, even though she was actually playing quite a few nights you know, compared to what a typical stadium tour looks like. So when you have that dynamic, not everyone can have a ticket. Um, you could, of course, price things up to the point where supply and demand reach some sort of point of equilibrium. But I think in, in her case, I suspect, I'm you know, not fine, that my intuition, that price would be so high that no one would, you know, it would be problematically high. Uh, that is where the secondary market can play a role because if, if you are have means and it is really important to you or your family to see Taylor Swift, no matter what, you will be able to find a ticket. Um, it's just that you may have to pay a pretty high price for it. Yeah, that's probably, it. yeah, maybe, maybe I kind of, uh, didn't, didn't use the right kind of wording within that, that question. So Actually, no, 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 it's, it's, there's not a simple answer. I mean, um, in some, for so many consumer experiences we're used to where, you know, you buy an iPhone and yeah, sure on day one, they have a finite supply, but they're going to, they make effectively an infinite supply of iPhones and thus basically clear whatever price, uh, the market will bear. That is not the case with live entertainment. There's a finite number of seats and, um, demand is actually pretty hard to, to predict. And that, that's one thing that a lot of artists deal with is they don't know if they're routing a tour, if they should have one show or three shows in a given metro. They just don't know exactly how much uh, demand there will be. They don't want to play in empty buildings. It's a bummer for the fan, it's a bummer for the artist. So they're kind of trying to learn on the fly and optimize their schedule and prices as they learn. Now, Taylor Swift, again, an outlier. I don't think anyone was worried about her playing in empty buildings, but for many, for many performers, that's a real concern. Yeah. So, so, uh, so yeah, we're using that example kind of within the music space, right? But since you uh, also operate across sports, um, you know, and, and a few different other categories, uh, do you see it, uh, you know, uh, specific kind of challenges within, uh, you know, certain categories? I think the challenge with the challenge that the sports industry dealing with from a sort of pricing and patching standpoint is historically the season ticket has been a bedrock of how teams, particularly in the United States, it works a bit differently abroad. But in the United States, it's a bedrock of how teams sell inventory and it has benefits for teams in that they get a lot of known revenue up front to de-risk their season, regardless of how the team plays. They know they have an amount of money coming in. The reality is most people don't want to go to 81 baseball games. And uh, there's I mean, currently kind of a sorting out among teams of how they're going to reconcile the fact that they're, they're selling a product that walks in a lower amount of known revenue and giving up upside in the process. Got it. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, also too, so we were, we were kind of mentioning the categories, um, but also there's also the, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, as far as like that kind of local, um, you know, markets, uh, as far as network effects there. Um, so, so how many uh, markets do you operate in again? Currently, for the consumer product, the U.S. and Canada, basically any meaningful study seeking is in for anything with events. In the U.K. And, and other parts of Europe, we only currently offer our enterprise product. So majority of the English Premier League, for example, uses SeatGeek as their primary ticketing product. But at the moment, we do not put a consumer-facing SeatGeek experience on top of it. At the moment, it is white labeled with each individual property. So, so one thing I did also want to uh, get into a little bit here before we get into the uh, group questions is, uh, as far as uh, some of the marketing that you've done is, uh, you know, on, on the creative side with influencer kind of uh, partnerships. Um, so could you maybe mm -hmm. share a little bit more about, you know, your experience with that in the past and, uh, you know, how, how effective it's been with us, Seeky? No, it's been great. We, we sponsor a lot of influencers, primarily on YouTube and Instagram. It's very bespoke. It's not like Google ads where you can just, you know, pour in some money, give it some keywords and then let AI do the rest. It's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand working with individual influencers. We are lucky in that we're selling something that very naturally is something that influencers can talk about authentically and weave into their own content. If we were selling machine parts or toilet paper, it would probably be harder for us to have a really bold influencer marketing strategy. 
but because it's very natural for us to sponsor an influencer, you take your father to a World Series game and they're crying throughout, you know, but very often emotional. Uh, it's it's something that's been very authentic to our brand and uh, required, I think, a lot of losing because for the, the average influencer, I shouldn't say average, the modal influencer deal that we do is not profitable. We will sign with an influencer, we'll sponsor them, try to make it work and what will but those that do work have really asymmetric upside. And as such, as a portfolio, uh, that channel has been really good for us. Yeah. So you, so you mentioned brand. So how, how important uh, do you think, you know, building the Seeky kind of brand is? And, and maybe like, was that like, uh, how, you know, I would say like historically kind of like looking back, um, when did you really think about kind of focusing on that? We've always cared about it because we, you know, I used to be a designer with other you know, designers on the founding team. Like, like we just cared deeply about Seeky looks and feels. And thought that an extension of that beyond the product, what we kind of mean to consumers was a advantage we had insofar as much of our competition was not really well liked. But we started really more meaningfully investing in brand advertising more recently. Something we've done on and off, but really only in earnest over the last year or two. And I think it's really important because it's, like I mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a category where the major players are known by most Americans focused in the U.S. market, but not necessarily well liked. Which means that if you can be known and well liked, it's a real opportunity. It certainly seems like it. So, so we're going to get into group questions here in a in a second because I know uh, we have quite a few that want to come on. Um, but you know, one thing I did want to ask about is uh, you know the fundraising journey. So you know, you recently uh, announced your uh, I believe it was like your ser- Series E round, and uh, you know, so huge congrats on that, by the way. And you definitely have some awesome investors on board. So could you maybe share a little bit more about what the uh, fundraising journey has been like, uh, even from the earliest kind of days? Yeah, I mean, it, it's changed a lot over the years. We, I think an aggregate of rates were around half a billion at this point. We we intended to go public via SPAC this past year, 2022. We ended up pulling back given what happened with the market and instead raised the, the private round the series that you mentioned. Our largest investor has been Excel, who led our first uh, large institutional round back in 2014, they let our series B. Um, and we've had, you know, throughout the subsequent rounds, we've brought in new folks, but for the most part, our insiders have re-upped and led and been very involved in, in the subsequent rounds we've done. Yeah. So, uh, if we go back maybe to the early, to the early stages, right. So I would say like kind of seed like series A, you know, what were there's like specific challenges, you know, at, at that stage with fundraising, um, just for a little bit of context, we have a lot of, uh, kind of see, I would say like seed series A stage founders in the community that are fundraising. Of course, everything was a challenge. Uh, it was so long ago that I'm not even sure how relevant it is. You know, this is back when like you started Seekeek basically in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis where it was really hard to raise money and we didn't raise much as a result. I think our first, we, we did an accelerator program sort of before white Combinator was predominant. Uh, we then really did it and ended up being about a $700 million pre-seed round would now be called and then did effectively another pre-seed round and then it was about a million, another million subsequently. But each time we were kind of proving we didn't have a ton of runway and we were proving that the, the investors were making a good decision by, by putting in more versus having something that we could you know, comfortably operate with for three years. Got it. Cool. So uh, actually, so someone uh, sent me a question in here. Um, let's see, it's uh, asking about the, uh, the the pandemic. So uh, you, you briefly mentioned it. I'm sure it had a you know massive impact on the business. So could you maybe share a little bit more about uh, about that? You know how it impacted the business and how you thought through it at the time. It was not fun. Wouldn't recommend uh, doing what we do. Well, uh, COVID happened. We initially did a small cut, but pretty quickly raised flat round for us. It was a bummer. We would have raised it at least twice that if we raised pre, pre-COVID, but raised a flat round, raised a little over 100 million bucks and chose that amount because we knew it was enough to get us through COVID healthily, even in the more downside COVID page. So after that, we started hiring again, we focused on capturing market share. And that was in stark com- comparison to what all of our competitors were doing. Most of our competitors were cutting deeply. For most of 2020, there was basically no revenue. So there was a there was a business case for doing that, but we thought that if we could focus the team instead on growing market share, capturing market share, the, the, in 2020, the number you were multiplying that market share by was the minimum, that's not interesting. 
But if we could maintain the market share once the market came back, then it would be very much worthwhile. That is what ended up happening. So we kept hiring, tried to keep the team motivated, even though we weren't able to sell much, focused very much on what products can we build because we are through and through a technology company, what products can we build to put us in a position post COVID to have something radically better than uh, our competitors. Yeah, definitely. I uh, want to expand on the uh, note about products. It seems like you're a very uh, kind of tech uh, product focused uh, team, but uh, I, I, I want to take up all the time here. Just asking all the questions myself here. So we'll call in some of the uh, founders. Um, hey, uh, Olivia, do you want to come on? Yeah, for sure. Hey, thanks, Mike. And thanks so much, Jack. Um, this was an awesome chat. I uh, learned a ton. So yeah, thanks for the insights today. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, you spoke a little bit uh, about partnerships. So you kind of mentioned, you know, Dallas Cowboys and what that partnership looked like. But, um, you know, maybe if we could kind of wind back a little and talk about the early days, like, can you talk about some of the strategies or like tactics that you use kind of in those early days thinking about, you know, getting your first few partnerships? Like, what did you test? What worked? What didn't? Um, maybe if you can kind of give a little bit of insight around that, that would be awesome. The you know, partnerships is the sort of generic term that people use, uh, myself included. I mean, lots of, you know, obviously talking about it in the context of just clients. But early on, it was not that. It was actually more what would probably be called biz dev. And uh, our strategy for really the first three or four years was to, this is back when SEO and SEM were more dominant forms of that user acquisition and mobile wasn't relevant yet, to get as many links to CT across the internet as possible. Ticketing is a category where there's much, there's a lot of natural places across the internet where you could kind of imagine adding a ticket link that would add value and make money for us and the partner. So think about like a sports website that has a list of upcoming games, very natural place to take a ticket link so that if someone looking at an upcoming schedule for their team and they want to buy a ticket, it's a natural handoff. We, our strategy to try to get as many of those as possible was to basically do the integration work for the counterparty in a, in a, in a situation where no one else would. So the, the sort of default situation might be ESPN, like someone who's never one of our partners. ESPN wants to integrate with a ticketing partner. Three different companies bid on it. They each send them the, their API docs and ESPN makes a choice. We instead would basically do all of the, the kind of backwards engineer, the counterparties website so that they just have to make a single HTTP request. Um, and we could look at the, you know, basically the refer where that was coming from and, uh, the link would automatically work and as a result, we are able to get a bunch of inbound traffic to SeatGeek in places that otherwise weren't able to get over the activation energy to actually get a business deal live. Thanks for the info. That's super helpful. Yeah. Great question. Thanks for sharing a little bit more on that with us, uh, Jack. Hey, uh, Benjamin, do you want to jump on? Sure. Thank you guys, uh, Jack. It's it's awesome to hear your story and congrats on this journey. I mean, almost 14 years, it's pretty incredible. Um, it's kind of a two-part question, same theme though. Um, obviously, building a startup in a marketplace is a grind. You have to deal with multiple stakeholders. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of things have changed, including the pandemic. Um, when you were starting out and today, um, what was something that you didn't know when you were starting out that surprised you or you wish you knew? And what's something today that you don't know that you wish you did for your business? The most surprising thing about our work, me at least, is how much we pivoted and how many times. I think we were lucky to have chosen a pretty broken industry, such that there were lots of things to pivot into. And pivot's maybe the wrong word, I guess expand is probably a better word. It's not like we changed business models, we just widened the aperture and to take on more. Um, the, we didn't really know what we were doing, but the thing we lucked into that allowed us to, to do all that was that we chose a pretty broken industry that had a lot of different places for improvement and optimization. And I'm not forgetting the second part of your question. What's something today that you don't know that you would love to know for your business that you wish you knew? Something that mm -hmm. I guess, frankly, is where you're vulnerable as a founder. We are currently betting on hybrid slash remote work being permanent. And that's a bit of a bet. I mean, I'm not sure it's necessarily the way things look in 10 years. And I would, if, if, if I think everyone's still learning as we go, um, we had clarity on that. I'm sure it would change how we're hiring and kind of 
sort of culture we're building, what offices we have, et cetera. But right now we're taking a little bit of a hedgy approach that I don't love, but I think it's necessary to so opaque okay, how that pans out. Thank you. Hey, Andrew, do you want to jump on? So familiar face. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jack, for spending time with the with the community today. <laughs> um, you know, as you probably gathered, most of the folks in here are early stage founders, operators trying to t- trying to get going in what is a, an environment probably pretty similar to when you started um, in, in terms of fundraising and, and access to capital and and just general the general grit and grind required. I guess like the que- question I have maybe it's a little bit of a, of a you know, meta question, but if you look back and think about when you guys started, do you think that was a good thing for you in retrospect that you, you know, it wasn't easy to raise money, you know, you had to prove things one step at a time, or do you wish, you know, you were able to raise a bunch of capital, you had a vision, you would, you would, you know, you knew what, you knew it was required. I mean, that's, I don't, I don't, it's, it, I don't know if that's, you know, how you think about things, but I, I just, I, I think about the world today is very similar to what it looked like in 2009. Also, like if you just think about like what you guys have been through, um, and this is probably obvious to anybody just watching. You said you're not. I don't think you're like the, you know, hype up the company type founder. But you guys <clears> have been through so many like massive challenges between COVID and like you know SPAC deal and you know fighting of in- industry incumbents. I guess just how did you think about that? journey and what advice do you have like to the founders today who are maybe thinking that they're crazy to be to be trying this right now i think in the first point i think it's super interesting i think about that a lot we're in n of one so i don't really know the answer i my hot take is that talent matters more I mean, meaning like imagine you stack rank everyone on this call in terms of talent you know good they are and that's just not just intelligence but drive and lord knows what else I think if you're at the top of that stack rank, it's good to start in a bad market. And if you're at the bottom, pretty bad to start in a bad market because you, you have less competition and if you, you, you know, marketplaces are actually really random <laughs> to be a doubter, but like compared to enterprise SaaS, marketplaces are hard and importantly, they're kind of random. It, there's a lightning in a bottle component that just does not exist in other categories. So you have to get a little bit lucky and it just, how lucky you have to get, I think is a bit of a function of time. In a bad market, there's less luck, so luck, but less luck necessary than in a good market, um, which is good if you're really good at what you do. It's not good if, insofar as everyone has any success with the marketplace, won a bit of a lottery. It's not good if you're just playing the lottery to get lucky. I don't know if that makes any sense. Think about it. I, mean, I I I don't I don't know how to ask this question the right way, but like, do you think that do you think that the company is better? And I have an opinion as an outsider watching you guys that it, that the company is stronger because you were started in that kind of environment. For us, I think it worked out well, and it worked out well because we had uh, we also got lucky. We 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 easily could have failed if you, if you rerun that experiment and we we started CD ten times. I think the majority of those times we fail here. Cool. Um. Looks like uh, we actually that uh, prompted quite a few questions here. Do you want to jump on, uh, Henry? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Jack, for the time. Um, I, I'm really curious about kind of going back to what Andrew was talking about the the time and place that you were and how you leveraged some of the you know the the trends and technologies um, as they were beginning to become popularized and being like a first mover in you know social media marketing and influencer marketing and SEO. Obviously, those are you know fairly competitive strategies for customer acquisition nowadays. What are you seeing from where you are as like the version of those today? Like, what are the most potent strategies that you guys are leveraging? And also, if you know you could go back ten years in time, you know what would you be as a market young marketplace founder be trying to exploit? The answer for us isn't going to be relevant to most folks on this call because it's very CT specific and it's the specific insight that control of the whole value chain matters a lot. And we have a competitor that is a product from the seventies. Um, I mean, basically by signing more enterprise clients, we can deliver a radically better fan experience and client experience. I don't think that generalizes pretty well. In fact, we've really struggled to find analogs in other industries where that is true. He squint, he can maybe make the argument that what Open Table has done in the restaurant world, 
elements of that where they basically sell a POS reservation system into restaurants for free or at a substantial discount. Um, that's vertically integrated up to the actual consumer experience and there's some sort of flywheel that starts, but I, I don't think it applies to the most markets. Um, I think it's a relatively tough time right now from a user acquisition standpoint to spend money in a way that generates really outsized returns. And as a result, you must naturally have to go to things that are more organic and the specifics of what works organic looks different across every business. Uh, I think that's what makes it tough is that there's not a generalizable answer. Um, maybe unsatisfying, but, uh, our approach has just been to try lots of different things and double down on the few that work. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. So we'll try to squeeze in uh, one last question here. Hey, uh, Hey Mike, do you uh, want to come on? Sure. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Mike. This has been really great. Uh, it, you kind of just said it in your recent comment and then had said it earlier in the aspect of providing enterprise software to say like the Dallas Cowboys and then you know on the same time you're selling seats and then sort of reference that with the the open table so is enterprise software as part of the offering literally free it's not something you monetize and you do that to get the seats or are you monetizing both and was it like that and what aspect of providing the enterprise uh side led to the growth of the inventory we definitely monetize the enterprise side as well we the way we do that varies a little bit by deal but in general in the us we charge a percentage of a sale and that percent varies based on the event type but like you mentioned most of the value that we get is not from what we directly charge but rather from the inventory we bring out the CT and the users we acquire so they're in you know, the Cowboys example you mentioned, we might have, you know, have a bunch of new folks on SeatGeek who are Cowboys fans who previously didn't know about us, hopefully deliver them a good experience. And then when they want to go see a Texas Rangers game or when Rihanna announced the tour in Dusty Town, hopefully, then they will use SeatGeek to buy tickets. Even if those events are not happening in our client's venue, they still use SeatGeek. So it's a great way for us to have the consumer side of the business feed the enterprise side and vice versa. Got it. Well, this is a great uh, last question to wrap things up. Um, so yeah, so thanks again for taking the time to join us here. This is uh, really great to you know uh, learn more about your experience and uh, all these great insights at the uh, building SeatGeek. And huge uh, congrats uh, on the uh, you know 14 year journey to to where we're at today. So certainly uh, super super uh, impressive and uh, respectful here as uh, marketplace founders and teams kind of in the trenches ourselves. Um, so I actually had you know one last question for you myself and. Uh, you know, is there kind of one, uh, maybe uh, through like one kind of initial partnership early on where you're just like, hey, like this was like on my kind of bucket list of like, we've made it when you secured that partnership or or whatnot? The first meaningful one, I don't think we thought we made it, but the one that really gave us any sort of relevance at all was I was mentioning earlier, we did these deals where we would effectively do the engineering work on behalf, on behalf of the counterparty. And the time, I don't think it's true anymore, Yahoo Sports was actually the biggest sports site on the internet. They were bigger than ESPN, which was you know, how long ago this was. But we did one such deal with Yahoo Sports. And at that point in time, it was a huge fraction of our traffic and also had secondary benefits with regard to SEO. So that really gave us at least a, you know, all of a sudden we had sample sizes where we could A-B test with and we could do interesting things and actually begin to have a base to grow off of. Awesome. Well, that's a great way to wrap things up. So we once again, really appreciate it. And uh, last but not least, time for a quick plug. Where can we uh, keep up with you at and follow along? No, I do not have much of an internet presence. So uh, unfortunately, I do not have much to offer there. But We'll just use SeatGeek instead. <laughs>